Welcome to part two of guinea pigs, humans and carrots in which we'll have a look at the roles of vitamin C in some detail, uh, mostly in the context of deficiency diseases. Um, so what does this term mean? When you use a term like that you should always find a formal dish definition and references. Um, surprisingly this took a little bit of tracking down. Most books and papers just use the term without de defining it, which is a bit annoying. Uh, cats, including lol cats, can produce endogenous vitamin C, so really don't need supplements. Popeye's consumption of spinach would have protected that particular scurvy dog from vitamin C deficiency. Um, not sure if it's true of his girlfriend Olive Oil, who may have had a range of nutritional issues that probably needed addressing. Okay, everyone say, ah. In many cases, nutritional defic deficiencies will produce easily identifiable, sim identifiable symptoms. Within a few months or even weeks, this sad looking puppy clearly has rickets, a, a bone growth problem caused by lack of vitamin D. Um, this paper I've quoted in there, taken from a lecture by Robert Heaney, is one of a number that have appeared recently questioning the validity of clinical trials for understanding nutrition, especially in populations. Uh, he also noticed that most people, or noted rather, uh, in most people, homeostatic mechanisms act to keep me most metabolites in those that are indicators of nutrient status within relatively narrow ranges of concentrations. Uh, I plan to come back to this in, in a later video uh, outside this series. Um, for now I'll mention that he makes a clear distinction between index diseases such as scurvy and longer term or non-index diseases. Uh, this distinction is uh, now considered to be key to our understanding of the more subtle effects of below optimal inputs and nutrients. And the diagram from his paper shows the various ways nutrient deficiency may lead uh, to disease and dysfunction. Uh, it's a nice image of a scurvy dog being force fed a lemon. Uh, it's from a good online essay reviewing many of the deficiency diseases. Well worth having a look at. Uh, the poor sailor probably struggled a bit with eating a lemon. Uh, this is something biology and food students can look forward uh, to next year in human metabolism endocrinology where they will be asked if they want to chew on lemons. Um, the secret is to temporarily modify the structure of your taste receptors for bitterness using the extract of the miracle berry. It really does work. You'd be surprised. Okay, scurvy in the UK. Not a deservedly obscure track by the Sex Pistols, uh, but the answer to it a parliamentary question. As we mentioned before, scurvy's largely forgotten, but it hasn't quite gone, as we can see from those statistics there. Um, okay, rows of vitamin C. Uh, so what do we need vitamin C for? It's got an important uh, role in the synthesis of collagen, which we're going to look at in quite a lot of detail. And it has other roles, many of which are not that well understood. Uh, the paper here by Naidu is open access and is well worth reading if you're interested in this area. Sums up the key issue as well. Uh, for a general, good quality review of health topics, NHS choices is recommended. Uh, when you search for things like vitamin C or any uh, nutrient on the internet, you'll find a lot of people who want to sell you things. Uh, this is a better source. Um, so why do we need this? Here's a lengthy list. As I mentioned, we're going to look at collagen synthesis in a bit more detail shortly. Uh, but first we'll have a quick review of some of the other roles identified here and what they relate to. Uh, so noradrenaline is a neurotransmitter. I'm going to explain what that means in a sec. Uh, vitamin C is twice involved in the pathway that synthesizes carnitine. Uh, this is involved the transfer of long chain fatty acids across the mitochondrial membrane, where they're used to produce energy in a process called beta oxidation. Uh, if you don't have enough carnitine, because you don't have the vitamin C in your diet, it is one of the explanations for the associated muscle weakness. Uh, the enzyme Peptidyl glycine alpha amidating monooxygenase is involved in the activation of various neural hormones and hormone releasing factors, and again it requires vitamin C, which is also needed for the catabolism of the amino acid tyrosine. Uh, it does have some important antioxidant functions, <coughs> pardon me. Being water soluble, it can act as an antioxidant against a wide range of free radicals. Um, this is a complicated area of which more in a bit. First we'll talk about some specifics of those things we mentioned briefly there. Um, this is the pathway for, uh, uh, a summary of the pathway for synthesis of noradrenaline from dopamine. Um, don't worry too much about the details. 
Um, noradrenaline is a neurotransmitter involved in stress response. Uh, if you see an American source, it's often referred to as norepinephrine. It's sometimes called the flight or flight hormone since it increases the heart rate, dilutes the pupils, and dilates air passages in the lungs. Um, vitamin C is involved in a hydroxylation reaction mediated by the enzyme dopamine beta and monooxygenase, which converts dopamine to noradrenaline. Uh, this is an example of the oxyreductase class of enzymes, uh, which we did mention in the lecture. As their name suggests, they're involved in oxidation reactions. Um, it's involved twice, vitamin C, that is, in the pathway that synthesizes carnitine. Uh, as I mentioned, this is involved in the transfer of long chain fatty acids across the mitochondrial membrane, where it's used to produce energy. Uh, synthesis is a bit complicated, uh, and I've just highlighted the steps involved in vitamin C. Uh, you notice there there's a molecule uh, called trimethyl lysine. Um, I think we need to say something about that, and in doing so, we'll bring in some other aspects of chemistry. Uh, there's lysine, amino acid which you're familiar with. It undergoes something called a post-translational modification to make trimethyl lysine. Biochemistry is complicated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, lysine is an essential amino acid, one we need to get from our diet. We can then do lots of things with it, such as sticking it to proteins, catabolizing it to produce energy, um, and it's involved in a range of uh, roles, such as calcium absorption, synthesis of hormones, antibodies, and enzymes. Um, as we've seen, it's also involved in the biosynthesis of carnitine, where it's first converted into a molecule called trimethyl lysine. Uh, by a methyl transferase enzyme, that is one that adds methyl groups into its substrate. Uh, before we go any further, uh, students might want to check that they can identify the three methyl groups that have been added to lysine now. I uh, beg your pardon, added to lysine. Maybe pause the video now. Um, and there they are, we've highlighted them there. Uh, one thing worth mentioning here is that is with many enzyme mediated reactions only a sing single functional group has been changed. Let's go back a bit. Um, the amine group uh, has been trimethylated. Uh, reactions are often look more complicated than they actually are. Um, okay, I've switched from chemist to lazy mode there to explicitly show the carbons and hydrogens in the new methyl group. Uh, I did this because one other thing we want to look at is a nitrogen atom. Um, going back to basics, and remember what we know about the valence of nitrogen. It has seven electrons, two in the non-bonding inner shell. Uh, the other five, typic two typically form a lone pair. Um, remember the structure of ammonia if you're not sure how this works. Uh, so nitrogen forms three bonds typically. Here it's been bonded to the carbon chain and the three methyl groups. Um, the clue here is in the positive charge. We'll slip in a little bit more chemical nomenclature here before move, moving on. Um, you often see textbooks referring to primary, secondary and tertiary amine. amines. They may occasionally mention quaternary amine. So how does this arise? Um, on the left we have primary amine, where the nitrogen is bonded to two hydrogens and an R group, um, which might, for example, be a methyl group. In the secondary amines, there are two R groups and only one hydrogen, and three R groups in the tertiary amines. That would seem to be about as far as we can go. However, in some cases, such as the action of the enzyme we saw a bit earlier, it's possible to add a fourth R group. Um, here, one of the electrons of a lone pair is now involved in the bond to R4, leaving the nitrogen with a net positive charge. Um, you might want to skip back to the slide on methyl lysine to make sure we understand what's going on here. OK, we're back on track with the activation of neuropeptides, which begs the question, what is a neuropeptide? Um, they're small protein-like molecules used to send signals between neurons. Uh, the enzyme peptidylglycine alpha amidating monooxygenase is involved in the activation of various ones of these, and it requires vitamin C. Um, in evolutionary terms, neuropeptides seem to have been around for a while, uh, members of the hydrogenous lack neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine and serotonin. They use many neuropeptides. They are part of their nidaria, uh, which includes sea anemones, corals, and jellyfish. And hydra are considered to be the most ancient of this class. Um, 
And as you can imagine, there's limited fossil evidence since soft bodies uh, rarely fossilise. It has been suggested they date back to the Bendian, or late Precambrian period, which is about 650 to 543 million years ago. But there isn't much fossil evidence about them until 65 million years ago in the Kenzoic. Now, one interesting issue around Hydra is that it's been suggested that they don't grow old and die. It's been suggested that Hydra escape aging by constantly renewing their tissues. A uh, bit of a controversial area. Uh, Martin has his paper there studied three groups of Hydra for four years and found no evidence for aging. Other authors, authors such as Estep uh, have actually suggested that the data support the opposite conclusion. Um, okay, back to the chemistry. Uh, vitamin C is also needed for catabolism and amino acid tyrosine, and another one of those complicated multi enzyme pathways, which I've just summarised here. Uh, eventually, tyrosine is catabolised to acetoacetate and fumarate, uh, two molecules that are important in energy metabolism. Antioxidant effects a interesting controversial area. Um, there's a definition of it. Um, Cytotoxicity is where a substance is toxic to cells, causing them to become damaged or even die. And this is a complicated area, and anyone who tells you otherwise is probably trying to sell you something you likely don't really need. The brief version is, we inhale oxygen and transport it to our cells, where it's involved in the production of energy by cellular respiration. All well and good. Uh, the problem is that oxygen is pretty good at producing free radicals. Uh, chemical species with an unpaired electron. These free radicals are potentially capable of causing oxidative damage to proteins, lipids and DNA and have been linked to diseases such as cancer, heart disease and neurogenitive conditions such as Alzheimer's. Um, the price we pay for oxidative metabolism. Uh, as I mentioned a bit earlier, it's often difficult to generalise results from in vitro studies for example, studies in, in, in the lab or even clinical trials to populations. Uh, we know from epidemiological studies that fruit and vegetables are a good thing and the antioxidant effect of nutrients such as vitamin C may be important but it's not possible to be specific uh, about this in the way that many people would claim. Be careful about such claims. The key is always to look for the evidence yourself. Okay, the next video in this series is entirely about the structure of collagen. It's worth going into because it's interesting in itself, but also because it helps us review protein structure in general. Uh, but here I'm going to briefly review collagen synthesis. Uh, I'm not going to go into it's, it's a protein, obviously. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of protein synthesis, which is covered in other places in the syllabus. However, I will mention this video from the NDSU Virtual Cell Animation Animations Project. As ever, in this series, a nicely spoken American lady explains the topic very well. Definitely recommend it. Um, metabolic pathway for collagen synthesis is well understood in terms of the reaction sequence and enzymes involved. Maybe not so well understood in terms of how that sequence is controlled. Uh, as mentioned earlier in the video, a couple of key enzymes, I uh, beg your pardon, a couple of key reactions involving enzymes called hydrolases require vitamin C. Uh, they produce modifications to the amino acids proline and lysine to form hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine. We'll come back to this in the next video. Um, in this case, the, the term post-translational modification I've used there refers to changes to the amino acid that have happened af after they have been synthesized. Okay, that's as much as I want to say for this one. Uh, thanks for listening. And next week we'll have a, uh, next week or whenever I do this, maybe later on today, we'll have a look at uh, collagen structure and link it to our general understanding of protein structure. Okay, thank you very much.